So this was my uh, setup today, was putting the phone up on here, just like that. Today we're going to be looking at significant figures and uh, a couple of the other pieces that go with significant figures. One of those would be determining why we need to know how many decimal places we have in a final answer. And that comes down to both accuracy and precision of the measuring tools that we're using. We don't want to be too uh, precise with our answer where we have five decimals when we were only given maybe a one decimal place for, for our measured values prior to making the calculation. So we want to make sure that we are being congruent or that we're being consistent in what we're doing. Here's one scenario that will help you understand where and why we use the rules we learned about significant figures in the real world. Let's pretend you're hired as a chemical technologist for a company that produces pharmaceuticals. For one project, you have to pour 32.5 milliliters from a collection vessel and separate the liquid samples into seven equal parts in seven test vials. Using a calculator, you calculate the size of each sample by dividing 32.5 milliliters by seven, and you end up with the number that you see on your screen. When you record in your logs that each sample is 4.642, etc., milliliters, you find yourself in trouble with the lab shift supervisor for recording the inaccurate measurement. Double checking your calculation, you find that it still comes out to the same number, and you decide that you need to be more accurate by using more digits. Using a calculator with a larger display, you decide to record a number that's even longer, such as the one you see on your screen. We have an extra 86 at the end. Again, an email arrives the next day encouraging a more accurate measurement. Frustrated, you use a calculator application on your PC and you find out that the number is even more accurate. Take a look at your screen. Now I want to ask you, why as the technologist have you made things worse? Why would this final result be considered inaccurate when it's reporting in sample size to a position smaller than a trillionth of a milliliter? Now obviously our technologists, you, assume that the more digits represent a more accurate representation of the amount of each sample, and most students feel the same way. The problem is that when you use many digits, you're telling the reader that you have used instrumentation accurate enough to measure each precise amount. Now if this is true, that's good, it's fine. You can use the number of digits that correctly represent the precision of your measuring instrument and techniques. In this case, however, the starting amount was 32.5 milliliters. This measurement is only precise to three significant digits. Additionally, the lab supervisor seemed to realize that you were very unlikely to be able to divide the sample into so many samples accurate to a million trillion trillionth of a milliliter. Reporting such a long number falsely claims a precision that cannot be true. And that's just one reason why we use significant figures in the real world. Accuracy is how close a measured value is to the accepted or correct value. Precision, how reproducible your measurements are. Also, the numbers with more digits are more precise. And this is with is W with the little line over top, more digits. And I would say after the decimal are more precise. Are more precise. So accuracy, you're looking at how close a measured value is. So if you measure something and you're like, okay, it's supposed to be 2 meters, and is it close to 2 meters? Is it 2.1 meters? Is it 2.01 meters? The closer it is to that exact value, the more accurate 
the measurement is. And precision is, is how likely are you going to be able to re reproduce those measurements if you were to measure them again. So there's going to be times where it's easier to make measurements and times where it's going to be harder to make measurements. What would be hard to, to make an accurate measurement would be to drop something and then with you and your stopwatch clicking when you let go of the object to when it lands on the ground. That's not going to be the most precise way of measuring something. You're going to have values that will be off and your precision might not be as much as it could be. Your accuracy on that particular example could be off based on your uh, theoretical calculated example. We could use formulas to figure out how long it would actually take for an object to drop and we could then say well okay what do we actually calculate it to be based on what we timed it to be and then the difference between that would be how accurate was that experiment going to be. Um, if you want to talk about something that is relatively accurate uh, with an average talking about maybe say uh, a target over here Something that would be maybe like a high degree of average accuracy is maybe something like this, where if you average all these out, you're going to have something that's very, very accurate. So uh, accurate if you're taking the average. The next one, we're going to be looking for something that is precise but not accurate. So something that's pre precise and not accurate would look like this. So all the measurements, or in this case, the, the hits on the target are very close together. So they're all very much similar. So if you were to reproduce the measurements, you're going to be relatively the same. The unfortunate thing is, is that they're a little bit inaccurate uh, based on what the true, true value is. So this is precise, but not accurate. But not accurate. Lastly, we're going to be looking at something that's precise and accurate. So imagine that they're all even in that target. So this is accurate and precise. And precise. So that's the difference between some of these there. Precise, but not accurate because it's off from the true value. Here, it's both. The me measurements are relatively similar to each other. That makes it highly precise. And it's in the middle to the close to the target value, which is, makes it accurate as well. When making a measurement, the last digit is always an estimate or uncertain. And there's always a little bit of uncertainty when you're dealing with uh, significant figures. And again, the purpose uh, to deal with uncertain, like significant figures is to determine, well, we want to express our answer in a way in which it's representative of, of the actual answer. So we don't want to be adding too many decimal places and we also don't want to be neglecting and removing some of those decimal places that could help explain what our final answer is. We want to be precise and accurate with our final answer. All recorded data is considered significant. However, the last digit is deemed uncertain. A measuring instrument generally has a precision of plus or minus one half of its smallest division. So for example, you have a ruler that has millimeters as the smallest unit of division on it. That means it's going to be precise to within half of that value. So plus or minus half of a millimeter because anywhere to one side of that millimeter. So you have, say, a ruler right over here where you have zero, and then maybe let's add one more, one, and then two millimeters. Um, if you have an object that's somewhere in the middle here, you can round it up. If it's just below the half, you could round it down. So it'd be better to round it down maybe over here. Just below that, you round it down to one. Again, it's easy to see right now that, oh yeah, it's why don't you just say one and a half millimeters? Well, the thing is, is that when you're dealing with an actual, like, uh, actual one millimeter, it's so incredibly small, it's actually difficult to, to tell whether it's halfway between, a quarter of the way between, etc. And that's why you're only precise to the nearest half a millimeter. Because if it's beyond the half millimeter, you round it up. If it's less, you round it down. And that happens with all kinds of units, whether you're dealing with miles, kilometers, meters, etc. You're always going to have a specific value for your precision. Uh, we're not going to measure the width of the bench today. Um, if you want to measure your table width, you can go ahead and do that if you have yourself a tape measure at home. 
and then you can determine what uh, what the the precision is on that um, based on your unit. So if you're measuring in inches, it's going to be to the near sixteenth of an inch with most uh, measuring tapes. All right, we're going to move on to significant figures. The sig fig rules. There are five of these different rules, and let's go through them all. So. Rule number one, all non-zero numbers are considered significant. So anything, and again, we're, we're talking about, uh, in this case, the number 321. There are three non-zero numbers. That means it's going to have three significant figures, sometimes sig figs for short. So all non-zero numbers, uh, that this would be uh, three significant figures. If this number, instead of 321, was just the number 300, uh, it would only have one significant figure. And we'll get to that in a little bit. Number two, zeros that occur. In this particular case, uh, and not only just occur, but occur between digits. Occur between digits are significant. So here, the zeros occur between numbers. And so if we added these up, one, two, three, four, we're going to have four significant figures. For number three, in a non-decimal number, zeros to the right of other digits. are not significant. So now going back to that example before that if I had said 300 there would be two zeros after the three meaning there would only be one significant figure that three. So zeros to the right of other digits are not significant. So if we have 5200 these two zeros are not significant in the expression of whatever this answer is. It's only rounded to the nearest hundred, so to speak. So we only have two significant figures. So if we were to round values, we'd be rounding them to the nearest hundred over here. Here we'd be rounding them to the nearest one, because there's four significant figures. Here there's three, also to the nearest one. The fourth rule, zeros to the left of the first digit are not significant. So zeros to the left of the first digit. So the first digit is going to be the eight. So like other than a zero, so the non-zero. So eight is the first digit here. So all the numbers over here to the left are not going to be part of it. Uh, these are zero, zero, zero. They're just placeholders. So they are insignificant. We have two significant figures here, the eight and the five. Lastly, in a decimal number, zeros to the right of the last digit are significant. So zeros to the right of the last digit are significant. So after the decimal, the zeros count. Before the decimal, like here, in 5200, they do not count. Here, they're just placeholders. All right, we'll just, I guess, continue teaching in the dark. No, oh, there the lights go back on. 2500, so in this case, here's a decimal. These are uh, no longer placeholders. They are actually significant values. So you're saying that this is to the nearest 10,000th uh, place. So you have the, the tenths, the hundredths, the, the thousandths, the ten thousandths. And so it's, it's precise to the nearest 10,000th, or even half of that value, right? So we have four significant figures in this particular case here, as zeros uh, matter. How many sig figs are in each number? Uh, at this point here, just pause the video and try these first eight examples. Welcome back. We'll now take a look at whether you were correct or not. So this first one here, one five, the two zeros over here appear like with 
they're, they're not after the decimal. So if they're not after the decimal, they do not count. We're looking back to uh, rule number three in a non-decimal number. Uh, the zeros to the right are not significant. So we're going to have only two significant figures here. Here the zero appears between numbers, so it will be included in the sig figs. And we have one, two, three, four. Here, the zero does not count as it holds a place for the two values right over there, the three and the four. Same thing here. These zeros are just placeholders. That goes down to rule number four, uh, the first digit. The zeros don't count uh, to the left of the first digit. So the first digit is the three, then the nine. So again, we have two. The next one is only one. Here, it's the eight plus those two over there. So it's a total of three. This one here, it's the 3, 6, and the 0. The ones over here are placeholders. These are the significant values. We have 3 as well. And this last one, because there is a decimal, it's all of the numbers that, uh, that precede the 2 over here will be included in that. Um, so it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. There are actually 6 significant figures right over here. So it very much does matter. Like Including this decimal over here allows these zeros to actually count. Without that uh, decimal, uh, those zeros wouldn't actually count. So zeros to the right of the last digit are significant in a decimal number. This is a decimal number here. And then there's a couple rules because, again, we are going to be multiplying and dividing when we're using different formulas. Uh, specifically, even in our, uh, well, two units from now when we deal with kinematics, there's going to be a lot of multiplying, dividing, adding, subtracting. So what do we do in some of those situations? Well, when multiplying or dividing numbers, our final answer is always rounded. Off to the least number of significant number of significant figures or sig figs. So you look at whichever one has the least, and then that's the one that you are going to be using. So in this example here, if we have 350 times uh, 1.15, what you're going to have is two over here. And over here, there is one, two, three. So there's three sig figs in the one. There's two in the other. So our final answer can only be expressed to two. Why? Because this is only precise to two significant figures. It's not actually more precise than that. So we can't actually have a final answer that's more precise than, than one of the values that was given to find the answer. And that's, again, one of the reasons why significant figures is so important to, to understand uh, and to be able to express your answer that way. Otherwise, you're going to be expressing values that that are just meaningless by adding too many decimal places. Uh, and, and you just can't even state that with, uh, with a high degree of uh, precision. I, I, well, I, I, yeah, precision, I would say. So multiply this out. What do you end up getting? You get 402.5. But if I was to express my answer like this, I actually have four significant figures right now. And so I need to have only two. So what I will do is the following. In order to get two, because if I was to round this to 400, for example, I would only have one significant figure. And so the way to get two significant figures would be to do this. So instead of just expressing it as 400, I'm going to go 4.0 times 10 to the power of 2. So this is 400. If you were to go 100 times 4, it's 400. But uh, now I have two significant figures. I have the 4 and the 0 because it's after the decimal. So if it had been before, it wouldn't have counted. So this is the way to express uh, this answer right over here with two significant figures. The next one. Here we have four because there's a decimal, so all these zeros count. Here we only have two because there's no decimal, and so only the one and the five are significant. So again, our final answer will only be with, uh, with two significant figures in this particular case. So what we end up getting if we were to multiply this out is 30,000. And 30,000 is only one significant figure. And so we need to find a way to get two significant figures. So the way to do that is, again, write it in scientific notation. And we bring it over four places. It's greater than 10, so it's going to be a positive value. And we've moved it over four places, so it will be raised to the power of four. On our final value right over here, we have a very, very small number. Again, these first two zeros are placeholders. They do not count uh, for significant figures. 2, 6, 9, 5. There's 4 here. In this one, only 1. And so our final value is only going to be one significant figure. If we did actually multiply this out, you would get an answer of 2, 6, 9, 5. But 
if we're expressing it with significant figures, you're going to have a final answer of 0 0.3. You only want one significant figure, not four. All right, and that's based on the fact that you are multiplying by 100 over here. Because this 100 is not, not nearly as precise as this right over here. Uh, next, adding and subtracting. When adding or subtracting numbers, our final answer is always to the last digit found in both. To the last digit found in both. So here we're at the nearest hundredth, but here we're at the nearest one. So if we're at the nearest one here, we're going to go to the nearest one right over there. When you add these two up right over here, you're going to get like 82.65. And then 82.65 uh, is going to uh, be expressed as 83 uh, when you do to the last digit found in both. So the last digit found in both is the ones place. So it will be 83. For our next one right over here, it, it appears here's three decimals. So it's the nearest thousandth. So it's going to be to the, the nearest thousandth as well. So you can go this, take away this. And when you express your answer, it's going to be 0 0.348 third decimal. Here we have to the nearest hundredth, here to the nearest hundredth, and so when we express our answer it'll also be to the nearest hundredth. And so that, that's the way that it works with, with adding and uh, subtracting. All right, so any, any last thoughts on uh, the sig figs? One of the things to, to keep in mind, for the most part I'm going to be worried most about uh, kind of the idea of the multiplying and dividing s side of things. Uh, when counting it up. So you read a problem and you see your values right over here. So maybe you have 350 kilometers to travel and you're doing it in 1.15 seconds uh, and you're saying well how fast was I going? What was my velocity? When you express your velocity uh, you're gonna have your answer. It'll only be two significant figures. You're gonna be kinda counting them up saying how many does each one have and then picking the one that has the smaller of the two values. Uh, so again, it's very important in expressing your answer and to be like precise with, with your answer. So not overinflating your answer. That's really the, the main reason for this. Uh, again, this is not going to come up all the time. It's also going to be something that you, you may see in, in chemistry. And, uh, and it's not a bad idea to kind of learn what, what this is all about and, and how it works. And so now I might open up and do a question or two from the homework. So hold on a sec. All right, let's do one or two more examples here. So we're going to be starting right at the top. Why not? If we add these two together, 4.6 plus 3, using the correct significant figures, we know that this one only has the, this, the last digit over here is in the ones place. So the last digit here is in the ones place. So when we add them up, we're going to get 7.6. But that is going to become 8 when we express our answer because we want to the nearest one whole number. With, with adding, with multiplying the next one here, we have three sig figs, two sig figs, and one significant figure. So our final answer is going to be expressed as one uh, significant figure. And so if I was to punch this in on my calculator, 2.15 times 3.1 times 100, we're going to get 666.5. Well, when we round this to one significant figure, we're going to round to the nearest 100, and that's going to be 700. All right, uh, let's jump down perhaps a little bit. Maybe this subtracting one right over here. So in this one here, this appears to be the, the least, the tenths position. So tenths here, tenths, tenths. And so we're going to be subtracting all these values right over here. 74.16, take away 4.8, take away 0.47, and you get 68.89. Now when we express our answer, we want to the nearest tenth, and so we will round that 8 up to a 9, 68.9. And is there any dividing ones on here? No, there is not. So let's do one more multiplying one, maybe this uh, one right over here. 65 times this number here. So we have two significant figures here. 
on this one here, placeholder, so we have three significant figures right over there. 65 multiplied by 1, 2, 3, 8, 3, 7. We're going to get a number of 0 0.0544 and change. But we want only two significant figures. Right now we've expressed with three significant figures. So we're going to have a final answer of decimal 0, 054. And that'll be two significant figures. Hopefully that helps. And uh, good luck with the significant figures. We will now take a look at the angles. So you guys have a chance to then do this page and the other one right over here too. Soon and very soon, we're going to be working with angles uh, and expressing vectors with, uh, with the angles. So if it's not perfectly horizontal or perfectly per like vertical, you are going to have to express uh, your, your answers or even particular units with a specific angle. So we could have something where, again, maybe you are running off a cliff right over here and uh, you don't see it and you're kind of holding your hands out, out high here. You almost maybe even jumped and now off you go into the water. So we'll imagine it's a cliff with water at the bottom here, cliff jumping. And so when you're coming off of here, when you hit the ground while well, the water, you are going to be at a specific angle uh, comparatively to the horizontal here. So it might not be perfectly vertical, maybe there'll be a little bit of an angle. So maybe it'll be at an angle like this. And so now it's up to us to express this angle right over here uh, with, with words and with numbers. And so that's what we're going to be attempting to do below is that we're going to get a, a better sense as to how to actually express this vector right over here uh, as the angle it might be. So I'm taking a look at this right over here, the way I've drawn it, whatever. Um, maybe it's 40 degrees, 45. Let's just say it's 45. So we'll, we'll express this a, a little bit later. We'll come back to that one as to what that one looks like. That's also right in the middle. Maybe we'll choose 46 though, to make it, to make it a little different. All right. When labeling the direction of the angle, always remember to consider where the angle is being measured from and where uh, and which direction it is actually moving towards. The angle of the vector on the right can be written in five different ways. Any of these methods is, is considered correct. And I believe that I bolded the ones like number three and four are the ones that I prefer. So I, like I'll show you all these because again, there's going to be times where you may encounter one and two uh, late, later on. These are the ones that I kind of prefer. Uh, it just makes most sense to me, but again, like these will be acceptable answers. This last one, I'm not even sure why why I include it. So this one here, I honestly would just cross that one off, and we won't even talk about that one because I've really never seen uh, any anyone use that. So we'll do that. So this angle right over here, we have 40 degrees, and so if we were to label this north, east, south, and west, the way that this one is read is this: it's west, so completely west. 40 degrees north. So you're going west, it's now 40 degrees north of west. So west, 40 degrees north. Or conversely, when you have two lines that are perpendicular to each other, this is a 90 degree angle, um, this one also is a 90 degree angle. So this being a 90 degree angle right over here, what we have, the difference between 90 and 40, this would make this angle 50 degrees. It's important for this next number two here. This is saying it's north, n is for north, north, 50 degrees west. So you're now traveling 50 degrees west. So you are north going 50 degrees west. This is a way to express that. And again, why I say this preferred is this, this is just the method that, uh, that I have become familiar with and that I continue to use. And so it works like this. You have 40 degrees north of west. So again, you are west and you're going 40 degrees north of west. So in this particular example, my perfect solution would be number three because you already have the 40 degrees. You don't need to calculate the 50. So you might as well just say it's going to be 40 degrees north of west. So it was west. It's 40 degrees north of it. And this one over here, number four, is using this value, the 50 degrees. And it's saying, okay. I was north and I went 50 degrees west. So it's 50 degrees west 
of north. So 50 degrees west of the starting point being north. So again, any, anything between 1 to 4 would be acceptable. So if we took a look here, what is the direction of the following vector? Here we have, uh, again, this being representative of north right here. If it's 37 degrees in this direction, it's going to be, and we'll start with number 3 and 4, it's going to be 37 degrees east. We're going east of north. 37 degrees east of north, and often it's expressed within like square brackets like this. 37 degrees east of north, uh, and, and again, there is that the other option there in which, in which it can be expressed. So you could have it like this where we have east over here, and then we could find the difference between uh, 90 degrees and 37, which is 53. So if we're following the same pattern, we could say, well, it's 50 degrees, 53 degrees north of east. So again, the two preferred methods, if you want to work with one of the other methods, that's going to look like this. You're saying it's, let's look back to the original 37 here. It's north, 37 degrees east. So you are going... You're no longer going north. You're now going 37 degrees east of north. So it's north, 37 degrees east. And then if you notice, like look at what's going on here too. There's, there's some nice patterns that are happening here. So just be aware of them because sometimes you may think, oh, I got the wrong answer. Uh, and I will express my answer in one way. So maybe I express my final answer like this in one of the, the answer keys, right? And you're like, oh man, I didn't get that. I got this, 53 degrees north of east these are actually the same answer. And so they're expressed differently, but they're the same answer. So you see that they're the difference of the 90 over here, and then these are just swapped places here. So instead of east of north, it's north of east. And then it's the opposite of the 90. It's the difference of the 90. Same thing over here. You have north 37 degrees east. You've gone 37 degrees east. Or you can go east 53 degrees north. So you're starting east, and then you're going 53 degrees north. So the same idea here, you're switching the east and the north as well as uh, taking the difference between 90 and 37. And okay, we're looking at the next example here. Here this is west and if we draw this line right over here this is going to be south and we could already include this angle over here being 18 degrees and so inside there is 18 degrees so let's first start off with the 72 degrees again, all right? So in this case, right over here, it was originally west based on this angle right over here, and then it went 72 degrees south. So it's going 72 degrees south of west. It was once west, it's 72 degrees south of that. Conversely, it could be that you were south and now you're going 18 degrees west of south and again what have I done I've swapped the west and south as well as the finding the difference between 90 and 72 you can begin to see a pattern here if we're talking about the first method right over here it's west 72 degrees south or south, 18 degrees west. So again, maybe take a pause, try to see if you can actually write down all four of them. And now if you're back, this is the way it's gonna look here. So I have east, I have south. Okay, this is 41, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna, I'm going to have 49 degrees over here. Let's start with our given, this one right here. So it's gone 41 degrees east of south. And the other way is it could have gone 49 degrees south of east. And then take, taking these same values as before, we're looking at the 41 degrees here. Uh, it's south, 41 degrees east. Or lastly, it was east, east 49 degrees south. So. 
So again, all of these things that I've been teaching, it seems very random and it's true. It is very random. We've been doing trigonometry. We've been doing like uh, editing and changing formulas. We've been looking at significant figures and looking at how to express angles. These are all very essential uh, in beginning to understand the, the values, the numbers, how they work, um, the formulas, and how to express our, our final answers. And specifically the last two, significant figures, how to express your final answer, you need to be able to, to do that with, uh, with a good degree of precision. And then anytime we're dealing with more than just one direction, so more than just horizontal, your X axis, or vertical, your Y axis, anything in between, you're gonna be looking at values that need to be expressed with, uh, with angles, and then also talking about, well, wh what is it going on here? And there are gonna be times where we're not dealing with northeast, southwest. Sometimes we're just gonna be dealing with something like this. So let's come back to this one now. What we have here is the guy jumping off, or you jumping off in summertime off the cliff into the water. And now your final answer here is 46 degrees uh, below the horizontal. And so it'll be expressed a little bit different. And that's actually how you could express that. It's gonna be 46 degrees below the horizontal. And so there's no, no more ways in which you need to really describe that. You can just say, boom, th this is it right, right over here and, uh, and leave it at that. So you don't need three, four different ways to express it. You can just say one of them. So you, you might not have known exactly what direction this person was. I never said they were going east, north, south, west. So if that's the case, we can just say, well, here is like a uh, flat line. So the horizontal, how many degrees below the horizontal? And if we had shot something into the air, we could have then said X number of degrees above the horizontal. And, uh, and that's something else just to, to keep in mind as we go forward. So good luck with your, your homework. Hopefully you learned a thing or two. Uh, it is very valuable and, uh, and have fun. That's the most important thing.